and then give you some an up-to-date uh, insight about Mary's actions. So, a little bit about the Old Testament and Mary. One of the indications of how we should revere Mary is that the Old Testament is full of prophecies about her. And one of the main, the signal prophecies about Mary that is often read on her feast is that of Isaiah. Behold, a virgin will, shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Isaiah first introduces the prophecy to King Ahaz, telling him to ask for a sign from the Lord as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. As high as heaven pictures an eternal majesty, and as deep as Sheol, which is the Hebrew word for the underworld, links into the Song of Songs in the Old Testament, where it says, For love is as strong as death, a very flame of the Most High. So as deep as Sheol is therefore like the definition of love from the Song of Songs, as strong as death. Mary's heavenly majesty will be that of a mother's love and her son's kingdom will be one of the heart. In addition to this, we also get a glimpse of the sorrowful side of Mary's motherhood. Yes, it will be like heaven, spiritual, beautiful, and divine, as her son will be king of heaven. However, as strong as death is an indication that all the satanic powers will be arraigned in an attempt to attack her son, starting with Herod the Great, who tried to kill our Lord when he was newly born. As the book of Revelation says, the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. But Herod the Great did not succeed at that time. Mary's motherhood is therefore a balance between sublime love and the deep depths of sorrow. Mary almost certainly had read these passages from the Old Testament, as well as the one from Genesis, which you, I'm sure you're familiar with, which reads, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This passage is the link between our first mother, Eve, and our heavenly mother, Mary. Eve sinned by disobeying God, and Mary, in her perfection and freedom from sin, corrected this error and put humanity back on track for heaven. However, here again in this prophecy is a warning that the devil will attack. He will strike at Eve's offspring. In Hebrew, the word for heel is akev, but it is also a Hebrew verb, akav. And the verb has a different meaning, and it is not, doesn't mean heel, but it means to strike insidiously. So Satan will strike insidiously. He will try to strike at Mary's weakest spot. But since she is perfect, he will fail, and his head will be crushed instead. Now, how did the devil attack Mary? One way, almost certainly, was by attacking her son. Jesus made himself vulnerable and gave himself up to die for our sins. Satan thought he could deal a mortal blow to our Lord through the cross and attack Mary in the same process. Her love for our Lord was such that she suffered terribly through her seven sorrows, and these spanned her whole life. Sorrows that are all linked to her son's passion and suffering. 
we know that not only did our Lord triumph over Satan, but that Mary also, after her work on earth was complete, triumphed as like the prophet Elijah, she ascended to heaven. So I'd like to say a little bit then about her seven sorrows and link them to the way of the cross. As the seven sorrows are in a way a mini way of the cross and one in which when we go through the seven sorrows we are going through the way of the cross as well and i'll just highlight the links so the first sorrow of mary was when jesus was only a few years old and mary presented him at the temple 40 days after his birth two turtle doves were offered one in thanksgiving and another in atonement, the atonement for the sin of Eve. Again, this offering shows joy with sorrow. Simeon thanks God and tells Mary what I am sure a new, as a new mother was the last thing she wanted to hear. A sword would pierce her heart. This could mean only one thing for her. Her precious newborn will, would somehow be endangered, or even worse. The passion of Jesus is pre presented to her so soon after his joyous birth. It was a terrible sword she would have to bear all her life. Her mind would undoubtedly periodically flash back to this moment particularly when she later meets her son on his way to Calvary, which is at traditionally the fourth station of the cross. The second sorrow was not far behind. Joseph was woken in a dream and told to get up in haste and leave for Egypt. The child's life is at risk. He has been sentenced to death by Herod the Great. Thirty-three years later, Herod's son, Herod Antipas, would facilitate Pilate's condemnation of Jesus. So Herod's evil wish eventually happened. This sorrow, therefore, links with the first station of the cross, Jesus being condemned to death. But as a baby, Jesus' time had not yet come and he was rushed away at night into Egypt and safety by Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph must have been in anguish at the thought of their tender child being hunted down. And the way to Egypt was very far, 450 miles, a long way by foot. Mary's third sorrow came 12 years later when Mary and Joseph went up to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover and were unable to find Jesus for three days. You wonder how this came about, as this was certainly not an oversight on Mary's part. Jesus must have been a very independent young man as he responded to the directives of the Holy Spirit and his father and Mary would have come to understand this and allow him his independence. And Mary thought he was with friends. But maybe on the second morning when they woke they, and they found he was still not back and they couldn't find him, they began to worry and headed back to Jerusalem. And what anguish Mary must have had. Had she given him too much independence? The responsibility for God's son was on her, and he was now lost. Still, Mary must have had the faith that they would find him as they did. The links of this episode to the Passion are firstly that it was the time of Passover, and secondly that he was not found till the third day. Mary was to lose Jesus again for three days at a future Passover 21 years later, 
when he was placed in the tomb. So this sorrow, therefore, links to the 14th station of the cross. The fourth sorrow did not happen until 21 years later, when Jesus, at the time of Jesus' passion, and when he was carrying his cross, we must assume that there were day-to-day -day upsets in their lives as they were poor, and they had to put up with the Romans and Herod, but no events are recorded in the Gospels. But finally, the day of Jesus' passion arrived. Mary must have prepared for it mentally, but what would have prepared her for a meeting with her son on the way of the cross, him walking to his death, his face bathed in sweat and blood, and his head crowned with thorns. And this links to the fourth station of the cross, because Mary, that is when she, she met him in the fourth station, and Mary might have dreaded this happening as the crowd had become more and more negative towards him. And it was also possible that at that time Mary had a flashback to the, to the presentation when her sword was pierced at the prophecy of Simeon because now it was really coming to pass. This is what, this is what Simeon predicted. The fifth sorrow then was when our Lord was on the cross and it is singled out as the moment at which he said to her, Behold your son, looking at John. And Jesus might have sensed that his death was imminent and wanted to comfort Mary. To Mary, however, it was another sword in her heart, as she must have been hoping against hope that something would happen and for some reason that her son would be saved from having to die even though in her heart she must have realized it was necessary. And then the Gospel of Mark says that Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And this cry, too, must have cut very deeply into Mary's heart as she stood there with John. And this, this sorrow links with the twelfth station of the cross, Jesus' death on the cross. The sixth sorrow was after Jesus died, when he was taken down from the cross, linking in with the thirteenth station of the cross. The agony of receiving his dead body is captured in Michelangelo's Pietà. However, a further agony must have struck Mary's heart when the soldier came up, and because Jesus seemed to have died and he wanted to make sure, he thrust the spear into, thrust the lance into Jesus' side. And now Mary knew that he had died. She knew he could not feel pain. But what a terrible outrage this was, this was to her son's body and to her. And then the blood and water poured out, which she must have known carried a message, but must have distressed her terribly. Lastly, her seventh sorrow links with the 14th station when our Lord was placed in the tomb. This, of course, links back to her losing Jesus for three days at a Passover when he was aged 12. In Malta, there's a shrine of Our Lady of Tapinu where Mary spoke to a local villager, Carmni Grima, and she asked Carmni to say three Hail Marys in a little chapel that she was passing. And she said, say three Hail Marys in honor of the three days I spent in the tomb. Of course, this is not mentioned anywhere else that Mary spent three days in the tomb. But the mention of spending three days in the tomb that Mary spent three days is in fact, quite logical, and would suggest that like our Lord, Mary spent the same time as her son did in the tomb, and it was 
it was in a way uh, to, so that she would be like her son. So it, it does fit. It does fit that she may have been in the tomb for three days, like Jesus, before she was assumed into heaven. And it would be fitting for her, whose sorrows made her a living martyr to her son, and for whom those three days in, his t in the tomb would have seemed like an endless wait for her when he was in the tomb. Those three days would have been an endless wait. But of course, Mary had the faith and knew that he was going to resurrect. The last sorrow, therefore, is linked in this way to Mary's own death many years later, spanning her whole adult life. And of course, her sorrows must have been with her throughout her life. It wasn't just for the period of the Passion. So it started at Jesus' childhood and really stayed with her through her life. The seven sorrows therefore run closely parallel to the Passion. And sometimes we don't always have access to going around a church to say the Stations of the Cross. But I think the Mary's sorrows, a devotion to Mary's sorrows is very important. And Mary has asked us to have this devotion. And she gave St. Bridget seven promises, and you may be familiar with them. And these promises are made to anybody who meditate daily on the seven sorrows. And you have to say at least seven Hail Marys, one for each sorrow, and meditate briefly on each one. And that's a very short part of the day. But if you get into the habit of it, you, there's a wonderful list of promises that she gives. Firstly, I will grant peace to their families. Secondly, they will be enlightened about the divine mysteries. Thirdly, I will console them in pain and accompany them in work. Fourthly, I will give them whatever they ask for if it does not oppose my son's will or the sanctification of their souls. Fifthly, I will defend them in spiritual battles with the infernal enemy. Sixth, I will visibly help them at the moment of their death, and they will see the face of their mother. And lastly, she specifically says, I have asked my son, and he has given me the, he has allowed me to make this commitment, but that they will be taken directly from earthly life to eternal happiness. So she, spe she specifies that that is something that our Lord has allowed her to promise. So it's, it's, it is a wonderful devotion, and uh, I think we all, particularly with families, would benefit. Then what I'd like to go on to now is just a short reflection on Mary's motherhood and motherhood in relation to Mary. Christ recognized the dignity of motherhood in giving his mother the prime position in his church, ahead of, the, ahead of Peter and of the apostles. In motherhood, a woman becomes a dwelling for an immortal soul. And Mary's, especially hers, is the womb of the, of the dawn of the redemption. So she represents the model for all mothers. St. Thomas says that although human souls are initially imperfect, they experience the desire for perfection. So maybe this is why John the Baptist leapt in Elizabeth's womb when she heard Mary's salutation. That the exchange between Mary and Elizabeth was also an exchange between Jesus and John shows how tightly spiritually knit the souls of the preborn are to their mothers. Fulton Sheen says a mother's role is a priesthood. She brings God to man by serving as the vessel in which the soul will be implanted. She brings man to God in offering the newborn human infant back again to the Creator. Only a human mother shares in God's creative miracle to bring new saints to heaven. 
Mothers are therefore closer to God, the Creator, than any other creature. Zeli Martin says a mother should be a temple, a sanctuary, an altar, a tabernacle, a living sacrament for her new offspring, tending both the body and soul till it eventually attains union with the Creator at the end of life. Mary also shows that an active civic responsibility is an essential part of motherhood. At Kana, she personally felt the need to act and would not be put off even by her son. Mothers have a public role to protect all children. A mother's remit is not restricted to her own children, but instinctively spreads out to all, born or unborn. The womb is also the crucible of society, and while she personally ministers to her child, her motherhood spiritually holds the whole of society together. Sheen says a mother is nature's constant challenge to death, the bearer of cosmic plenitude, the herald of eternal realities, God's great cooperator. Children draw strength from their mothers throughout their lives. And there's an interesting interpretation of Psalm 110 that I would like to put forward to you, which to my mind stresses this, the link between our Lord and Mary. And you may remember Psalm 110. And it starts off, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And this is a Psalm by David and it relates to David's relationship with our Lord, with, with Christ, effectively. And then he goes on to say, yours is the dominion um, from the womb of the morning I begot you. And there again, Mary would fit in with that. And the Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. And it finishes by saying and talking about the, the Messiah. He will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his head. And I think you can see the brook by the way as Mary. Mary is the stream where our Lord drinks and he gains strength from this and he is able to lift up his head even when he is dying on the cross and say to Mary, behold your son and behold your mother. So Catholic, a Catholic mother lovingly emulates the generosity, faith and humility that made Mary God's first choice and that will bring her to Mary's side in heaven. There is no greater role given to humans than that of motherhood. So to finish up with, I'd just like to make a few comments about recent developments uh, about Mary in England. <clears throat> and English Catholics have believed for many centuries that England is Mary's dowry in a special sense and that she is our protectress. And Mary is only waiting for us to honor and venerate her through deep prayer and reparation to bring us in England back to the right path. And you probably know Leo XIII, Pope Leo XIII prophesied in 1893, when England goes back to Walsingham, Mary will return to England. Three years ago, England was rededicated as Mary's dowry. And this was 650 years after the first dedication in 1381, so it's a very important landmark. And the rededication occurred during the COVID lockdown. But the date was fixed before, so nobody ever knew that COVID was going to happen when this, this uh, dedication was going to happen. And two years before this rededication, the Our Lady's 
Our Lady of Walsingham's statue had been taken around parishes for two years prior to the rededication. Now, interestingly, the original dedication by Richard II was also carried out at a time of great domestic turmoil. So it fits in with, with the COVID, COVID um, what COVID did. So it, it is like it's, it's, it's a sign, it's a signal that this rededication is very important and that things are now happening and we must facilitate them. We must be part of the movement to restore the church. And St. James warns us we cannot be on the sidelines. We cannot just be hearers, but we have to be doers. We have to keep, St. James says, we have to keep ourselves unstained by the world. We must redouble our prayers to Our Lady, the Mediatrix of all graces. And finally, you may know that a London to Walsingham Camino, which is 150 miles and 13 stages, was just opened up last year. This pilgrimage route was the most popular pilgrimage route until Henry VIII closed it down in 1538, and it is now open again. So I think, again, it's a lovely sign. It is a lovely means of doing something uh, for Our Lady, and it is one practical way we can link London with Walsh. Our Lady, pray for us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.